it's a great uh, honor, a privilege to have uh, Professor Philip Kotler here today with us uh, to uh, actually add glamour and color to this uh, event. And as was mentioned about um, his, he is celebrating his 91st birthday today. First of all, before anything, uh, happy birthday to you, sir. Um, and uh, this of course, is a moment that we've been awaiting for. I think uh, this gathering, we have a gathering that represents a local marketing fraternity, the international marketing fraternity, both academics and the corporate sector. So uh, I consider it my privilege in inviting uh, Professor Philip Kotler, who is also known as uh, the father of uh, modern marketing. Of course, as undergraduates, it was uh, your book of marketing management that we referred and still several years have passed. It's still the same book that the undergraduates and the fresh uh, learners use as their reference guide. So, sir, by uh, wishing you a happy birthday, uh, I'm sure that our audience is more than willing and excited to uh, hear you speaking. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. I feel very honored uh, to hear these remarks. And uh, to Professor Nalin, I, I want to congratulate you for the even the idea of choosing a day for the National Marketing Day, which is unusual. I think you're the first country to do that, uh, to choose a date for marketing really. And uh, to the uh, all of you, I have much to share with you about what's gonna happen to our field of marketing, our businesses, our economy, and our society. Uh, I'm going to start with my PowerPoint slides, and I hope that they will open up right now. And it would be this set, and therefore it will be just a little larger. And let me go here. Okay. Uh, and I titled this Sustainable Marketing, Creating and Delivering Value. Now, the first cover page, that's just a little self-publicity about three books I wrote in the last few years. Uh, and I'm not gonna talk about them. However, Marketing 5.0 is one of them and it has been quite popular because it briefs our managers, our professional marketers in the latest things that have happened that they should be aware of in doing their marketing. And the second book, H2H, is, means human to human marketing. And it's very much a kind of a textbook. Um, it could be used as the textbook uh, or use my own or some other one, uh, but it um, also goes deeply into three new areas that normally are not covered in normal textbooks. And finally, I will have a lot to say about brands and uh, something that I call brand activism. So let me move on and say this, uh, Sri Lanka, as I mentioned, is one of the first countries to create a national marketing day and congratulations. And of course, I was pleased to be invited to speak on the day of my birthday, which is today. And I will speak about the role of marketing in these chaotic and confusing times. I also sympathize with the financial crisis in Sri Lanka about the need for debt reconstruction. <clears throat> and I do wish that uh, your country um, proceeds to tackle its problems and come out as a winner. And the whole world is there to sympathize and help and wish you the best they can in your re recovery. Now, I also mention one more thing, and that ha it has to do with maybe your sponsor, and it's about the English Tea Company. Thank you. I opened the box today. It arrived just in time. Uh, the most uh, fascinating teas, including a chocolate tea, but among others, and it was very thoughtful for you to introduce me to the fine teas made in your, uh, your country. Now, let's move on 
I'm going to answer five questions as best as I can, one at a time. But let me read the questions. What about marketing has remained the same, even though the times have changed? Has anything remained the same? And my answer is yes. And I'll tell you what it is when we get to that topic. But the second question then is, what's new thinking in marketing? What has occurred that is really new? And I will comment on that. Thirdly, what events and trends are shaping the future of marketing? Four, what role is marketing and CMOs, chief marketing officers, playing in organizations and in the economy? And five, what marketing responsibilities should companies address? Okay, let's start with the first. And as you listen to me, you might want to add some of your own thoughts. Because when I talk now about number one, what about marketing has remained the same? I'm gonna cite four or five things. And you can notice that I probably missed other things too. One thing that has remained central to the whole idea of modern marketing is customer centricity. The customer is first. We design our business in order to meet customer needs in the best way possible, to be a winner in meeting customer needs. Now, I'm going to add another thing that has been somewhat neglected. Uh, I would add a second centricity, and I would make it employee centricity. We need to recognize that we who sit in the big office doing our marketing planning aren't meeting the customer. It's the employees who are serving the customer. Even if they're in the factory, they ought to be thinking of the customer or in the office. So the thing is that I learned that from uh, my discussion with the CEO of the Marriott Hotel System. He said that he puts employees first and customers second. Well, that's unusual. How did he explain it? He said, our first job is to make the reception of the customer who comes into a Marriott a very fine experience at the desk of the receptionist. And we succeed when our receptionist and our employees and the people who clean our rooms, when all of the employees care about the customer, then the customer is going to come back a second time and a third time. So he says, maybe employees are even more central, but play it as it may, you may customer centricity and employee centricity to me would be a wonderful combination in our thinking. Also, what's gonna stay in basic marketing is four Ps, the four Ps, product, price, place, and promotion. Now, maybe there are more Ps, don't worry about that. Any marketing plan has to, deal with the products you're selling, the prices you're setting on the products, the place where people go to get the product, and also the promotion to communicate the, the real value of the product. So I don't care if you want to add two more Ps. One would be people. Okay. How about another being um, the, well, I was going to say packaging. You might say even where is packaging in the four Ps? Well, the product has packaging by definition. So when we plan the product, we plan the package along with that. So there's a little debate going on about uh, should the theory rest on four Ps, five Ps, whatever. We can talk about that. Another fundamental thing we have not changed at all is segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Every market 
is heterogeneous. Even if you say it's it's the car market or the um, fast food market, or whatever, it, it consists of so many com- segments, and it's important that you don't try to serve them all. Uh, Coca Cola does, of course, but mainly most small and medium enterprises have to choose serving a specific segment as well as possible. And in serving them and targeting them to make a good communication that shows the positioning, the brand of your company, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. I might even add the word branding. Branding is one of the things that won't change. We need it all the time. And then um, uh, there's one more thing that is sort sort of uh, mentioned there too. Uh, The fact is that my script is covered up there so I can't read it, but these are essentials that will remain the same. Let's move on to what's going to be new. Now that's also pretty obvious. The first one is that marketing has been revolutionized by the digital and social media. It's a new digital world. And I'll mention a little story about that. A CEO came to me once after a lecture and he asked me to sign uh, a copy of his Kotler book. So I look at the book, my God, the book was written, it was the first one I ever wrote. It was in 1967, it was called the first edition of marketing management. And I said, do you still use it? He says, yes, I have it on my desk. And so when a marketing problem comes up, I, I, get, I gather a lot of energy from reading what you might have addressed in that problem. I said, but, what do you think of the brand uh, branding section of the book? He says, I, I don't remember, there, there. I didn't think there was much on branding. What do you think of the internet section? He says, why, well, there's no, there was no internet when you wrote the book. So I said, why are you keeping that book? I said, I'm glad to sign it, but, but I'm on the 16th edition now. Don't you think you want an edition that covers all the changes in the world and not just what I wrote in, you cannot win with 1967 marketing in the year 2022. He got the point, he got the point. Another new thing is we thought we will stop when we finally identify segments to sell to. So our ad is sort of directed toward a segment, but now we're doing much more micro customer targeting, customer by customer. Now, by the way, that's not unfamiliar in B2B, where big businesses are selling to other big businesses and so on. And frankly, the salespeople know each customer a lot about each customer. On the other hand, let's go to a company B2C, business to consumer, take Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola can't possibly can it? Can it know every one of the millions and millions of drinkers of Coca-Cola? Yes, they have more and more information on everyone who drinks a Coca-Cola and where they shop and what media they watch. And we'll talk more about it. But this is a movement from just being satisfied with your planning centering on segments and now moving to micro customer targeting, which really brings up a lot of a need for a lot of tools to get that information about each customer. Another new thing is voice and facial uh, recognition and amplification. You know, now we could ask Siri, if you have a, uh, the, the, my smartphone, I say, Siri, what time is it? Siri, what's weather? What's the weather today? Siri, who wrote, uh, the book, uh, Gone with the Wind, and she can answer anything. Or Alexa, Alexa is answering a lot of questions. And not only that, we, we are forming chat, chat bots when we have a new product without having a salesman standing in front of you and you're in the supermarket and you're looking at a new product, 
you just press a button and there's a whole explanation, not only of the product, but it says, do you have any questions? Because the chatbot had anticipated the questions that most people will ask about that new product and answer them. So that's another feature. And, that, and then another one is we're very much interested in drawing maps of the customer journey and touch points. How did that person end, end up in my, my, my Mazda dealership? Or let's say my, I, I sell Honda, Honda, Hondas, or Yuna, Hunyas. In other words, how did a customer come to me? Did they just walk by our building and look in and see some cars and just inquire? Or did they get the idea of buying a new car and somehow look at a lot of ads? And maybe they also touched uh, with their friends and asked about what they drive. So every customer journey is mapped, is marked by touch points and you, you better have your presence at the main touch points when they turn to finding out information about you and other car makers. So we have to be understanding the different ways in which people end up buying something from us and what touched them, what were the touch points. Another thing that is happening strongly and it's more of a business than just a marketing thing. We are moving from shareholder value to stakeholder value. I believe that will become very well established more and more. See, when a company is only shareholder oriented, it's only concerned with two groups. What are the two groups? The customers and the shareholders. Who are the shareholders? Well, they're the people who gave the money to start the business and to support financing the business. Those are the only two that, and so if you are running your business the way Milton Friedman, Professor Milton Friedman, who was my own professor at the University of Chicago, he would say, your job is very simple. You have to maximize profits in your business. Don't worry about any causes. Don't use the money in your business to give away to people. After all, leave that to the owners, the shareholders. They'll get dividends and they can do what they want. If they want to help the homeless, if they want to help the hungry, let them do it. But don't make the company help. Well, I think that's very narrow. That is making profit maximization the, the thing, the only thing that counts. We're asking to be stack, stakeholder um, oriented. And you take a company, and this is a large one like Unilever. Unilever says we have seven stack, stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers, distributors. He goes on and on and says, and you, the communities in which we work, they are stakeholders. We could be hurting the community or helping the community. And don't forget the planet. The planet is at risk. It's getting warmer. So we want to do what we can to keep the planet going. So I think the companies that adopt the stakeholder and not a shareholder view of the business will in the long run make more money. If the object is just to make more money, it will be the stakeholder orientation that will deliver more money than shareholder holdings. Well, let's move on. That, this, these are what is new in marketing, but let's move on to what events and trends are shaping the future of marketing. Let's take it first with advertising. Um, I, I always think back on how many students chose advert, chose marketing as a field because they wanted to be making ads. 
and that, that's a lesser part of the whole business of marketing, but uh, it's still a very in, intriguing part. However, the ads that they would like to make are 30 second commercials. You know, they, just, they run for about 30 seconds. You hope you can even find out what the name of the company is. Sometimes they'll show a car driving uh, in rough terrain and uh, maybe in the last minute, mention the name of the car. Uh, I don't think those ads are very successful. Many of them are, they're easily forgotten. They look very much the same. Every car ad looks pretty much the same, unless you have a, a, a talking duck or some creature that you invented. But the main thing is, uh, when I look at the best ads made uh, for 30 second commercials, maybe one out of 20 or 30 really work. And that's a lot of money that you spent, a lot of cost in not only producing the ad, but then running it, paying for the circulation of the ad. Well, anyways, I did say earlier, in addition to the 30 second commercials, that much more advertising that really works will be targeted to the individual customer uh, with the help, of course, of Facebook, Google, Instagram, and people and those platforms. And those are advertising platforms. Well, not only are they advertising, they have already put together very much information about every person you could be interested in. They won't sell, you can't write to Facebook and say, tell me about person X, everything you know about. No, it's going to be your job as a company to find out what you think is important to know about person X. But Facebook has put together all these people who are supplying information to Facebook. And it's, that explains why they're a very effective advertiser. Now, more than advertising, do you know there's a form of it that is so important? That's word of mouth marketing. Uh, we trust much more what a friend or a user of some past product says about the product than what the ads, the ads are coming out of self-interest, of course. Therefore, they're often exaggerated, but we think our friends and our acquaintances at work and elsewhere tell us what they're feeling about the product we're interested in. And you can trigger more word of mouth. That's the reason I mentioned that. That's a form of advertising that you could trigger. There are a couple of good books on how to create much more word of mouth marketing. And then uh, now every customer can look up so much information. Look, I, I hear about a new restaurant. Do you think I go there immediately? Even if the word of mouth was my friend saying it's a good restaurant, I look up the reviews and I may find out that five of the seven people who had food at that restaurant found something wrong with that restaurant. Disappointing. So people are getting more information than they ever got before for making good decisions. Now, what about the sales force and the trends? Well, it's the old problem. Uh, many sales forces are not happy with the marketing group that runs the sales force and all these other four Ps. Why not? Well, because salesmen may say, I think they're, they set too high a quota. I can't sell 100 units a week. The price was set too high. Um, no one ever says they saw the ad of the company. The ads are not very good. So one of the points I make is that when I consult the company, I wanna to talk to the head of marketing separately and then the head of sales force separately. I will leave those two meetings knowing whether they are not only good people in their own jobs, but if they're working well together, it, it will tell me what they're saying about the other guy. And if it's bad, if, if the salesperson is really unhappy with the marketing people and vice versa, that company is gonna go down. 
So watch for that relationship. And I wrote a nice article in the Harvard Business Review called Ending the War Between Marketing and Sales. It's an old article, but it's still quoted all the time about making sure you don't have a war between marketing and sales. And what's worse is that sales forces are finding it difficult to be meeting clients. Let's take the pharmaceutical companies. The pharmaceutical companies uh, send very attractive uh, and able salespeople to visit a doctor to explain a new drug and, and so on. And the receptionist at the doctor's office says, no, you can't see the doctor. He's, he's too busy. Please leave the drug with us and leave the brochure and he'll call you up if he has any questions. There's a lot of places now which doesn't want a salesperson to show up on the grounds that they know enough without hearing, from, taking up their time with a Salesforce presentation. We have a lot to talk about that subject. Uh, what about retailing? Retailing has been hit so hard by COVID. Um, uh, restaurants closed down, hotels could almost close down or had very few rooms sold. Restaurants closed down. Um, the whole idea is people didn't have any vac vaccine at the time. It, it took a little time before we could even be vaccinated the first time and then have a, a booster and so on and so forth. But the real point is um, there's some forms of retailing that we will always need, even though most people learned how to do online buying in the COVID crisis. In other words, even people who never use the computer realized their friends showed them they should have a computer and place orders for products that will be delivered in the mail to them that they could return if this is being satisfied. Uh, so uh, online retailing grew very fast. And then those um, retailers that stayed open were basically car dealerships because you're not gonna buy a car without sitting in it. You're not gonna buy furniture without sitting on the furniture. Uh, but you don't have to go into a, a dress shop. There's plenty of online pictures of goods that are available for women to wear without going into the store. Now, will retailing get strong again? Yes, it will. When COVID is over, people like to shop more. Uh, however, is the store doing two things? online retailing and in-store retailing. They must do both, not just to do in-store alone. Secondly, the store must be an experience. It must be designed and the people, the clerks, the salespeople have to be interesting and enthusiastic. Otherwise, uh, they won't come back a second time. Um, and now as far as, uh, other things, uh, we, we better move on. The fourth question is what role is marketing and CMOs gonna play in companies? Now, this the name we're using is chief marketing officers. And uh, you, may, you may call your person the vice president of marketing or some other name, of course. Uh, but the CMOs in larger companies um, they worked very hard during COVID and with the new second problem that begins with the C, climate change. And in fact, there was much disappointment by a lot of big companies that the marketing didn't work as well as they had hoped. Of course, it's very hard to deliver the, the results we were delivering before COVID and the CMOs did their best. but. Can you imagine uh, they couldn't have live meetings with people and uh, gather them and, and get them into stores and so on? So we'll see what will happen to that ability. Um, and another 
unhappy thing is that CMOs are losing full control. Technically, from the time I wrote my book on, in 1967 on marketing management, I said, marketing doesn't work unless the chief marketing officer runs all four things. All right, product. Well, do you know there are still companies that develop a new product without having any marketer as part of the team? In fact, these are companies that say, to the marketer, well, we finally tested and made this new product, and now it's your turn to sell it for us. The poor salesperson will probably say, Jesus, seems to me you didn't put in enough of the things that customers will want. I think your price is too high. I, I, I think uh, the promotion, the ads you're talking about uh, as a possibility uh, is awful. In other words, shouldn't the CMO control all four Ps? Um, it turns out that we're losing uh, even control of price. You know that the uh, finance people, they want to set the price. They, they say, oh, here's the price that will deliver the return that we want. So there's, they have to negotiate with the marketing planners about what is best price. Uh, what about uh, just the delivering goods to the distribution centers uh, and to the stores? That's a logistics problem. It, it, it has to do with the one that we call, you know, uh, we, one of the pieces of the place is called place uh, because marketers should take care of arranging the channels of distribution, the locations where people will get the goods. But the fact is that um, there's even less control there. So how can, if, 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 I used to think that maybe the CMO at least runs price, but even there, it's not that simple. But the good CMOs are respected in their companies and they spend a lot of time, at least 50% of their time with the other chief officers because the good news is they have a job in which they have the title chief too. They're, with, they're working with the chief finance officer, the chief uh, uh, human resources officer, the chief product uh, development officer, et cetera. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, the, the thing is that there, I'm noticing that some companies want to generalize or change the name CMO. This is not happening very broadly. Some want to call the person the CGO, Chief Growth Officer. Growth. Well, I thought marketers were all about delivering growth, sales. And well, maybe, maybe growth takes more than just marketing training. It takes economic training and some other things. I don't know. Another time that said is, how about the chief uh, revenue officer? Shouldn't, shouldn't the job be in the hands of someone who is responsible for all the revenue that should come into the company? Of course, most of the revenue comes in from the goods and services being sold. Uh, and then there's a couple of companies that renamed the marketing person chief customer officer, chief customer officer. So you can think about that and find what you're comfortable with using. Now we've got uh, one more big question because uh, we're, we're, we're coming down to some end remarks. And that is what marketing responsibilities should companies address? Now, I've already talked to you about companies that do say we're for profit mainly or only. Um, and I told you that that's a limited way to think. And that's when I, I said, let's be stakeholder oriented. And there's lots of goods, lots of things we want to, to create successfully in our team. To have a good team, everyone has to feel a winner, not just the, the shareholders, not just the shareholders, everyone working for the company. Well, the new thing that's happening 
for responsibility is we now ask companies to pursue profits, but also to pursue sustainability. And sustainability is about making sure that we leave the world and to our next generation in the same way, at least, if not better, than we had, we experienced the world in our lives. And that means to, well, it means uh, several things that I'm gonna come to in a moment on sustainability. Another thing I would say that it does mean is we should run a circular economy instead of a linear economy as companies. Do you know, most companies simply make something and sell it, and then they have no further interest in what happens to it. In other words, if the product dies, well, they'll fix the product. But if the product is to be thrown away because it's finished, uh, who throws it away? Well, just the owner puts it in a garbage can or puts it in a, a land heap. Uh, but a company that cares about us running a circular economy doesn't want to see anything wasted. They want to take care of the company making the product, selling the product, and disposing of the product. <clears throat> because the product probably has copper in it, uh, chips in it, things that should be recovered. And so basically, uh, more and more of our thinking has to be sort of make, sell, and use and reuse and dispose of. Now, another thing about responsibility is companies want their brand to mean something more than we, product, we sell product X. How about it showing your character and showing your values as a company? How about choosing a cause <clears throat> that you should care about as a company? <clears throat> and hopefully it's not a, a highly debated cause because then that's gonna put you on the side of your, your against guns or for guns or your for abortion or for against abortion. No, I don't mean maybe causes like you, everyone is against seeing hunger. So you can be the company that wants to be, say that it's doing a lot to fight hunger. So choose a cause that will give more value creation uh, in your business. <clears throat> Uh, look, I was very impressed with four, with several of our companies when Russia invaded Ukraine. Our companies, uh, U.S. companies, thought very seriously about how can they keep making money in Russia while Russia is savaging another country. McDonald's withdrew; it closed its McDonald's, and as a matter of fact. McDonald's now in Russia is for sale. Now, that was very courageous. You may not agree that they should have done that. I mean, they gave up a fortune. Uh, although one of those oligarchs in Russia, rich oligarchs, will probably buy it and pay for the present value of the future income stream. In other words, when they take over McDonald's, maybe they will be allowed to use the name McDonald's or maybe they will not be allowed to use it. <clears throat> but Starbucks just recently said the same thing. We're gonna close all the Starbucks. <clears throat> so it shows character and so on. And maybe uh, the real need because of sustainability is to embrace a new idea for what business is all about and consumption, and it's called a degrowth, believing we might embrace degrowth. I'm gonna say more about that, let me move on, because here's the reason I get the degrowth. One, industrialization is wonderful. It aims to raise global living standards, and it has. In fact, uh, people want endless, economic growth if possible. However, that's a, not a possible thing to do, endless economic growth. 
because we have learned that as we increase industrialization, we're increasing pollution and carbon in the atmosphere. And carbon is bad because it's warming the planet. Now, that means we have to balance how much industrialization we can afford to do without burning up the planet, warming it up to the extent that everyone living at the equator flees for their life because they can't breathe at a temperature of 140 Fahrenheit degrees. So sustainability is about meeting present needs without harming future generations. And companies need to help with the greening of the world and the environmental protection of the world. And so we want to be meeting the sustainability challenge. And by the way, companies that start looking at that, they think that, oh, the cost will be high to change their ways. But even if it's high, in the long run, they will be sustainable companies and the buyers and the new and the millennials, this, the young people, they want to work for a company that cares about environment. And so you can't really say no to practicing sustainability. Now, what is there for, if, we, if, our, if our aim is not endless growth around the world, what do we mean by degrowth? Well, is it possible that the world's population is too large? You know, the world population grew from 3 billion to in 1960 to 8 billion in 2022. That's not many years. And what a growth rate, 8 billion. Uh, can the, does the earth have the caring capacity in terms of food, clothing, and shelter for 8 billion people? Now, we had a big debate about that in, in the 1970s. It was called the limits to growth debate. And beautiful pack, uh, passages were written about maybe we should go slower. And right now, I found a book by Christopher uh, Tucker, whose title is, the book is called A Planet of Three Billion. Now, he's, he's not saying you're going to destroy the extra seven, uh, you know, the extra people beyond three billion. But he's saying that technically his analysis is that the carrying capacity for a comfortable life for would be for three billion people. Um, well, uh, I then read a book called Less is More, uh, subtitled How the Growth Will Save the World. And uh, Jason Hickel wrote the book and he suggests four things. Hey, let's do a little less advertising because much of it is to push people into buying things that they can hardly afford. And the only reason they're buying it is because they have credit cards, which only makes more debt, more people bound to debt and suffering. He says, we must have less planned obsolescence. Why do you have to have a new car every two years? Why do you have to have the latest cell phone when the one that you have works perfectly well? Uh, less ownership and more sharing of assets. Do you need your own car? Why don't you just share cars? Uh, and that's what uh, Uber and Lyft uh, are doing too. Uh, the sharing of assets rather than each of us must have our own lawnmower just to cut grass. No, we should have one lawnmower for a whole set of families who have grass to cut. Uh, and then a, the next idea is more recovering of materials, reusing, more recycling of products and resources. So it's a mindset. So, cho so social, mar uh, social marketing be the key to pursuing less is more. Now, let me explain what I mean by social marketing. Most marketing is called commercial marketing. It's to buy and sell things. Social marketing is to make corrections where they are obviously needed. For example, 
under commercial marketing, a company sells cigarettes. Social marketing knows a lot of people are getting ill with cigarettes and dying younger. And it uses the very same marketing tools to help the person not want to smoke or get to start smoking. So social marketing is at cross, it, 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 it's sort of to discipline marketing where it's not really, where commercial marketing isn't really doing the best. Uh, for example, a lot of people like to gamble. And so commercial marketers say, let's put up a casino so they can gamble. The uh, social marketer would say, we've got ways to help gamblers stop gambling because they are being hurt so much and never winning really. So what I'm saying is degrowth means a lot of demarketing campaigns, which I list. One of them is water is in short supply in so many parts of the world. We've got to use marketing to get people to conserve water, to take a shower, not every day or every two days, but maybe once a week to stop having grass, growing grass. How about having um, cacti growing, you know, where it's not live grass, it's just stones and, and cactuses um, for their attractiveness, things like that. So I hope I'm getting you to think more about where shall Sri Lanka go, uh, the endless growth idea or the degrowth idea. Let's move to the two more things and we will be finished. I wanted to summarize some ways in which I look at the future. First one is I predict that buyers will be able to select the best brands without much advertising or salespeople in the future. Isn't that interesting? And in other words, the, the companies will find you without much advertising or salespeople. What will marketing success depend on? It will depend on first, very smart pricing. Secondly, strong branding. And third, owning dominant channel positions. Those three are magical if you can do that. Secondly, marketing creativity will be crucial, especially since we are moving into the era of experiential marketing, where marketers think it's not just a transaction, it's creating an experience of real value to the customer in the process of buying and selling. Third, marketers will make more use of customer journey marketing, touch point marketing, persona marketing, content marketing, and influencer marketing. Four, marketers will use virtual reality to gauge the buyer's interest in a possible new product. Today, a car company never made, builds a factory to make a new car. At first, builds a simulation, a virtual reality. Uh, it takes the, it, it puts on the computer a drawing of the whole car, and then it makes a simulation uh, where the prospect puts some glasses on, looks through the glasses and sees himself or herself entering a dealership, seeing the new car, opening the door, turning on the engine and driving it, getting a virtual experience of a car that was never made, but is being planned possibly. And if many of those experiencing this test say they love the experience, the company has enough confidence then to actually build the factory and make the car. Marketers will use neuroscience more and more to identify best stimuli and, um, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm gonna end with uh, two things. Uh, one is this diagram I take from the book H to H and I go like this, three bad times of, three bad types of marketing. The first is unethical marketing, that's bad. Uh, 
you may do it for your sake to sell some more things, but from the customer's point of view, it's bad. The second is wasteful marketing. Too many things done that get nowhere uh, with selling more product. And the third bad thing is inane marketing, maybe silly marketing, uh, having clowns. Uh, it's a, you know, those three, but what you really are after is H2H marketing, person to person marketing and so on. And finally, here's what I leave you with as a mantra. Within five years, if you're in the same business you are in now, you're going to be out of business. If you don't make changes, you're going to be out of business. And the big mantra is join profitability with sustainability and thereby build a better company of your own and a better company for the people and your country. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to share the evolving situation of marketing in the world with all the things that are happening and where it's going. Thank you very much.